I can't offer you marijuana like my dear friend Raquel. <laughs> but I will try to do something. I will try to re redeem my country uh, for, for its role in the war on drugs. And so um, thank you for inviting me. I am honored to be comrades with these two in this battle. And I am so delighted to see all of these people here today. Um, and um, so let's do it. Uh, what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit. Uh, I'm a scientist and I've been studying this thing for about 24 years, this issue of drugs. But no one was listening. People only started to listen since I published this book. And by the way, I hope you all go out and buy it. <laughs> People have started to listen now, and I think they're listening now not so much because of new information, but because the information is being communicated in a way in which you understand. And it, it has taken me 24 years to realize that the first goal of scientists is not communication. The first goal of scientists is not to be wrong. That's not good. The first goal should be communication. And so what we're gonna do here today is communicate. And I'm gonna to communicate today with you all by telling you a story. And within that story, you're gonna understand a little something about the science and the politics surrounding drugs and abuse, okay? In order to tell you that story, I have to tell you a little something about me. So before I became the scientist that I am, I started out as a wayward youth, someone who got in trouble. I grew up in the communities, as you all call them, favelas, I believe. I grew up in those kind of communities. And having grown up in those communities, I did some things that I'm not so proud of today, some things that mainstream society you might find abhorrent. When I was a youth, I was on my way to jail or an early death. Because, like many of my peers, my colleagues, I carried a gun, I engaged in petty crime, I robbed people, I, I used drugs, I sold drugs. I did a number of those things that I'm not proud of today. Now, the question is, how does one start out in the hood, in the favelas? and end up being before you here in a packed auditorium. How does that happen? How did I go from that, that background? I have to tell you, I'm, this is a bit confusing, but I just have to interrupt for a second. Because I don't have my slides coming. This is bizarre, I can't control this. All right. Okay, I may control of this now, but this is bizarre. The question becomes, let's go back to the question, how did I become who I am today after having gone from uh, 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 a wayward youth in the hood? How did I become the first African-American tenured scientist at Columbia University? How did that happen? There are some things that we know as societies, as scientists, that could help people move from the prevalence and move into mainstream to becoming productive tax-paying citizens, to contributing to the society. We know these things, but we pretend that we don't. So we act as if people like me are exceptions. I am not an exception. There are many more smart people, smarter than I am, who grew up like I did, and who in this country is growing up like I grew up. They're smarter than me, but they won't make it because society has decided that they're not worth it. And so what I'm going to do today, I hope, is to help you see how I became the person I am. And maybe you can offer some suggestions to your government to help other folks. This is, this is a picture, a photo of my family. In the back row are my sisters, and kneeling down is my mother, and my brothers are on the second row. The point here is that my father is not there. He, was, he, he left when I was about six. And my mother was always working, so she really wasn't there. But all of their children are 
successful. They all paid taxes, they all contributed to the society. They were, we all supported each other. And we are all successful in part because, can I get the next slide? In part because of the federal government provided programs that helped families like mine. This is a picture of what we call in the United States food stamps. These are, these are monies given to poor people in order to help them buy food. We did this for poor folks in our country, people like me. It ensured that we would physically develop. It ensured that we would emotionally and psychologically develop. There were other programs that the government provided to ensure that we all were successful, that we became taxpaying citizens. Now, these programs were dramatically cut in the 1980s under President Ronald Reagan. And then they were continually cut under even Democrats like Bill Clinton got rid of the program entirely. These are people who were supposedly on our side. They are not on our side. But the point here is that we know some things that work, but society has made decisions and choices not to invest in those things because they decided that those people don't really count. This is another sort of thing that helped me move along. This is a picture of me in the US military. I was in the US military after graduating from high school. I couldn't find a job, I couldn't go to university. I wasn't, I, I did, we didn't have the money for me to go to university. Not only that, my education was so poor before university that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have qualified based on the entrance examination. But I went to the US military where I was allowed to go to university. But I was educated in the UK because I was stationed in the UK for much of my time in the US military. And in the UK, they were giving, they were offering an honest critique of US society in ways that we do not offer that critique in the United States. For example, in, in the UK, it wasn't a secret that the US was racially discriminatory. It was not a secret, but that was confirmed, that was affirming to me. It corroborated my reality. It made me want to study even harder to learn more about the history of racism in my country so I would be able to share with other people. And it really lit a fire under me. It really inspired me, intensified my desire to be educated. Now, so this, is, this happens in the US quite a bit where poor people have to go into the military. That's not too different, can I get the next slide? That's not too different to what happens here in this country. This is a slide here, for example, of your military in one of the favelas in Rio, policing its own people. The difference here is that those guys in the military don't seem to be getting the education or the knowledge that they are participating in the subjugation of their own people. So it's important that when people do move into the military in these spaces, that they also get education. But that doesn't seem to be happening. But that's okay for young people because you have you have an opportunity to continue to learn, as I did, because when I was in the military, I certainly was not the person I am today. But you hope that those folks will be getting education so they can see what's really going on in a society. Now, when I was in the military in the 1980s, in the United States, we had this new phenomenon, this new crisis. This new crisis was crack cocaine. And I was starting to become conscious. I was starting to want to make a contribution to my society. And I was trying to figure out how. This is a sign. This is a sign. This is a, 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 a graffiti of a sign that says crack is whack, meaning that crack is bad and not cool. And you saw these in the 1980s throughout the United States. These sort of billboards, advertisement, telling the community 
that crack is the real problem that faces the community. And there were, this is a, a, an image of the group called Public Enemy, the hip hop group. You all know Public Enemy, the hip hop group, right? They made a song called The Night of the Living Bass Heads, uh, telling people that crack was the real problem that was destroying the community. Public Enemy, by the way, is my favorite hip hop group. They were trying to be conscious, trying to make sure that the community understood what their what problems faced them. And they said it was crack cocaine. Um, next slide. This is a this is a slide of a, a film called New Jack City. Have you guys heard of New Jack City? Anybody in the house? We have some people from the hood. You've heard of New Jack City? New Jack City was a film that, that, that showed the horrors of crack cocaine. This drug dealer, Nino Brown, took over a housing project, a favela, basically, in New York City. And he ran his drug operation out of that. And he was a vicious, violent person. This is what the film said. And they told us that this was the reality. Just to give you a preview or a forecast, that's not the reality, and we'll talk about that in a second, but people were told that was the reality. And as I think about what happened in the 1980s in the United States, I think about this country today. You guys are back to the future. This is, you are in 1986 in the United States today in your thinking about crack cocaine. Now this is an article that was published a couple years ago called New Jack Rio a take off of New Jack City. It's published by a woman who would eventually become my student. But she was in Rio on a Fulbright scholarship and she wrote this article. I love her dearly. The article is awful. <laughs> because it is full of hysteria and inaccuracies about drugs. It's saying that drugs has destroyed the favelas and the community, and it threatens life, said the crack business. It says this without any sort of knowledge of history. Before crack appeared here about 10 years ago, before that, were the favelas, were the people in the favelas thriving? Were they, were they doing well? Were they going on vacation? twice a year. <laughs> so these kinds of things defy logic, but you, the public, believe them. So I want to go back to my sort of development. Can you have the next slide? Back to my development. This is me in the lab after leaving the military. When I left the military, I decided to dedicate myself to solving the drug problem, to solving drug addiction. I started to study neuroscience so I could understand the underlying neural mechanisms that were responsible for drug addiction. And I was going to go about solving crack cocaine addiction, and in doing so, I thought that I was going to solve the problems of my community. And that's what I did. Next slide, please. In 1996, I began studying with, 1998, I'm sorry, I began studying with this woman. Her name is Marion Fishman. She was the first person that sent Sigmund Freud to give cocaine to people in the lab and study their behavior. So I began studying with her, and in 1996, she published a paper comparing the effects of crack and powder cocaine. And she reported those in this study. I'll tell you about the findings in a second. But I think you should know, next slide please. With her, I got quite an education. And when one gets an education, it's important that you know this particular saying from one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin said that the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. And that's what I did. When I started to really examine the US society, some troubling things began to appear. Some things that radically changed or challenged my thinking. Can I get the next slide? 
Next, please. The things that challenge my thinking about drugs, like crack cocaine, for example. I learned, the next slide, please. I learned that crack and powder cocaine are the same drug. This slide shows the chemical structure of cocaine. On your left is powder cocaine. On your right is crack cocaine. The only difference is the red circle on your left, and that's a hydrochloride group. That's a salt that makes it stable so you can't smoke it. That's the only difference. It has no biological activity. It does not contribute to the pharmacology of cocaine. They are the same drug. We have known this forever. But in the United States, one of the things we did in 1986, by the way, where you are today, one of the things we did was to punish violations for crack cocaine a hundred times more harshly than violations for powder cocaine. And crack cocaine at the time was associated with poor black people in the United States. Even though they didn't use the drug at higher rates than white people, it was associated with them. So what we did was pass these laws, and then we did something else. We put all of our, pol our police forces, like your military, like you're doing today, we put all our military in the favelas, in the poor neighborhoods. And as a result, next slide please, as a result, 80% of the people that we arrested for crack cocaine were black in the United States. 80%, even though they don't make up most of the users. But what, what it gave, it gave the society a simple sort of excuse. It told the society that, see, we're arresting all of these black people because they're the users. No, it's where you're placing your resources, your law enforcement resources. It's really simple. But the problem is, logic gives way to hysteria surrounding drugs. That's the problem. So these sorts of things started to challenge my thinking. Next slide, please. Another thing that challenged my thinking about crack cocaine was this notion Oh, go back, please. <laughs> See, this is why science talks, this is why science talks are so boring, because the setup is not really good for a scientist, right? Or for a presenter, so you want to make sure that the presenter has control, so you can, never mind, next slide. <laughs> So there was, there was this notion that one, one hit of the drug, you're, you're addicted to cocaine, or one hit of crack cocaine and then you're addicted. That's not true. There is no thing, there is nothing in the world where you take one hit and you're addicted. Uh, some people will tell you that, but that's just simply not true. Addiction by definition requires work. Not one time, multiple times. Next slide, please. This is Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto, he came out and said that he was a drug user. He was a crack cocaine user. He was not addicted to cocaine or crack. He went to work every day. He paid his taxes. He supported his family. He was a responsible person. Mind you, some people think that he was a jerk, but that didn't have anything to do with his cocaine use. The point is, the point is, people can use drugs and still be responsible. People can use crack cocaine and still be responsible. As we will see, and some of you all have seen already in the next slide, please. These are the former presidents of the United States. They all are former, well I shouldn't say former because I'm sure they drink alcohol. They all have admitted to illegal drug use. Bill Clinton admitted to smoking marijuana. George Bush admitted to smoking marijuana, but is widely suspected of having done cocaine. Barack Obama, of course, has admitted to marijuana as well as cocaine. 
The point here is not to besmirch their reputation. They have all contributed to their country in ways that people in that country approve of. That's not the point. The point is that they all have used these drugs and they are all responsible people at some level, right? <laughs> That's the point. And this, by the way, th this is the typical drug user. Next slide, please. <laughs> Another sort of misconception that I had was that crack users were only motivated by another hit of the drug. They were only motivated to get another hit of the drug. Next slide, please. That's, that was part of the research that I've done in order to really investigate that question. One of the things that we had been taught, particularly in my early education as a college student, we were told that when you allow laboratory animals to press a lever to receive injection, uh, intravenous injections of drugs like cocaine and amphetamines, they would inject themselves or press the lever until they die. That is true. That is true until you look more closely. When you look more closely, you understand that the, the laboratory animal only had access to the drug and nothing else. But if you provide that animal access to other things, like a sexually receptive mate, a running wheel, sweet treats, an enriched environment, they do not press the lever until death. In fact, they would prefer to engage in those other activities under many conditions. So I thought it would be interesting to do a study in which you brought cocaine addicts, into crack cocaine addicts into the lab, and you offered them an opportunity to take crack or something else. In this case, they were offered an opportunity to take the drug or $5. And what we found was they took the drug on about half of the occasions when $5 was available. It let us know that these folks were not only being responsive to the drug, but they were highly responsive to environmental manipulations. So you can alter drug taking behavior simply by providing alternatives that people can engage in. It's simple. We've known this from the laboratory animal research, we know it from the humans, and we know it from drug treatment. There are types of drug treatment based on this. That's simple. Next slide, please. These myths, however, about crack in my country now have been extended to a drug called methamphetamine. Next slide, please. This is a picture of a brain. This is a brain imaging picture. On your left, you will see the image of a normal brain. On your right, you will see the image of a methamphetamine addict. And some people, who, and some of them call themselves scientists, will tell you that those, this brain image tells you something about the person's behavior. It doesn't. It tells you absolutely nothing about the person's behavior. I'll tell you why. It tells you nothing about the person's behavior because if you take a woman and you take a man and you image their brains, you will find differences. There will be some areas in which men have more cells or, or uh, uh, cellular processes than, uh, than women. But no one will say that these women are brain damaged. Well, maybe somebody might say that. Some of them say that. <laughs> but no rational person will say that, right? And if we take the brains of people on this side of the room versus that side of the room, what we'll find, we'll find some differences. But we won't draw conclusions about those differences in terms of behavior. That would be inappropriate. Next slide, please. What I noticed was the scientific literature was replete with claims based on those type of images. So, I published a paper about a year and a half ago that critically reviewed the scientific literature on brain imaging and cognitive functioning in methamphetamine users. What I found was that methamphetamine users' cognitive functioning was within the normal range, the typical range, when you controlled 
for age and education. So they performed just like anybody else who, uh, who had the same amount of education as them and who was the same age. However, when you look at the brain imaging sort of literature, there are claims that just do not support the data. Despite the data that's collected by the researchers, they still make these claims that these people are cognitively impaired or brain damaged. Just simply not appropriate. That's why the public, in many cases, are misinformed about drugs. So one of the goals that I like to do is make sure that the public is more literate in terms of science. In order to be literate in terms of science, all you have to do is look at the data yourself not what people are telling you. Just ask people to show you the data. I don't really care what you're saying. Just tell me, just show me the data. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we did as well in the study, in, in my studies, was to bring methamphetamine addicts into the lab and do the same study with, that we did with crack cocaine, but this time offer more money. If you focus your attention on the red bar, please, that's the number of opportunities, the choices that the methamphetamine users had to take the drug. When you offer them a choice between the drug and nothing, they take the drug on every occasion. Next slide, please. When you offer them a choice between the drug and $5, they take the drug on half of the occasion. But when we offer them a choice between a drug and $20, next slide please, they never take the drug. They behave rationally. This is inconsistent with what has been said about drug users. Just simply, they behave just like you and me, rationally. Next slide please. And we also have this notion that we can have drug-free societies. In the United States, we've said that we want to have a drug-free America, a drug-free community. This notion is, how can I say, ridiculous. This notion is ridiculous. It's ridiculous because there has never been a drug-free society, there never will be a drug-free society, and you don't want to live in a drug-free society, I assure you. Next slide, please. But as I said, you guys are, are repeating what we did in the United States. This was, I was in Rio recently and I, I uh, took this picture. This, was, this is a picture of a government car. And on the car it said, crack, it's possible to win. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but the idea is that crack is somehow has human qualities or something. <laughs> But this is the kind of nonsense that happened in the 1980s in the United States. Next slide, please. Another thing that challenged my, note, my, my sort of thinking was the amount of money that we're spending in the United States to control drugs. Between 1970 and 2011, we increased the amount of money that we spent on controlling drugs by 3,500%. We now spend $26 billion a year to control drugs. Next slide, please. When you spend that kind of money, you have to have results. And the results that we get in the United States is that we now, the number one reason we arrest people is for drug violations. Drug violations constitute the most amount of arrest in the United States. Now, I should tell you something as well. People sometimes say, well, you're arresting the drug dealers, the traffickers. No, 80% of the people that we arrest for drugs in our country are for simple possession. Simple possession of marijuana, by the way. 80% of the people that we arrest are for simple possession. So it's not the traffickers, it's people, just regular folks. Next slide, please. When you have this situation, Spending this kind of money, arresting large numbers of people in your population, you have to ask the question, how and why is this justified? And when I think about how and why this is justified in the United States, I have to go back, not far, but I go back and look at the history. Next slide, please. And I have to look at one of my heroes. When he was struggling with the war of his day, the war of his day was the Vietnam War. Martin Luther King, 
called that war unjust, evil, and futile. He said of the Vietnam War. He also said, by the way, the war on drugs is an international war. Make no mistake about it, as I hope you all clearly understand. Martin Luther King said, in international conflicts, the truth is hard to come by because most nations are deceived about themselves. You certainly are deceived about yourselves as we are in the United States. Rationalizations and incessant, scapes, uh, incessant search for scapegoats are psychological cataracts that blind us to our sins. This is what Martin Luther King said about the Vietnam War. The same can be said about the war on drugs. Next slide, please. But we still have to answer this next, please. We still have to answer this why. Why are we doing this? Well, many people say that the war on drugs is a failure. It's an international failure. Those people are naive. The war on drugs is not a failure. The war on drugs is a huge success. It's a huge success for law enforcement people. They get a lot of money for fighting the war on drugs. They get jobs for fighting the war on drugs. The war on drugs is a huge success for politicians. Politicians don't have to deal with the social problems that people face. Politicians don't have to deal with social justice. They can just tell you, and poor people included, cocaine, crack is the problem, and we can win. That's what we'll go after. We will go after crack, and we'll go after cocaine. And then so they don't have to deal with lack of education. They don't have to deal with lack of employment. They don't have to deal with lack of skills. Parents also are benefiting from the war on drugs because they don't have to teach their kids anything about drugs. Imagine if parents didn't have to teach their kids about edu sex education. Well, some don't. But imagine if parents didn't have to teach their kids about sex. People could get in trouble. They, could, they would have unprotected sex, you would have pregnancies and so forth. Imagine if parents didn't have to teach their kids how to drive an automobile safely. People would get in trouble. Parents don't have to say anything about drugs. The only thing they have to say is don't do them. That's not good. That's not, that's not good for shaping critical thinking. You want to be able to engage your kid to think about not only drugs, but a wide range of things. So the major point here is that we don't have to deal with other problems if we go at the crack. And that's what politicians do. And many of the society is fooled by this. Much of the people who run your media, they are fooled by this. Next slide, please. So when you do this sort of thing, you have to have scapegoats. And so the question becomes, who are the scapegoats in your society, in my society? Next slide, please. In the United States, our Attorney General, who is the number one law enforcement official in the country, has said, remarkably, has said that the way we apply our drug laws in the United States is racially discriminatory. We all knew this for many years, but they only just said it in 2013. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the scapegoats in the United States. I don't have a, po a pointer, I don't think. So if you focus your attention, oh, I do. If you focus your attention here, black people in the United States make up 12% of the population, 14% of the drug users, 15% of the drug abusers are drug addicts. 35% of the people arrested for drugs. 55% of the people convicted for drugs and 70% of the people sent to jail for drugs. There, those are the scapegoats in the United States. Black people are the scapegoats in terms of drug policy. And so when you think about this situation, you can't help but recall the words of Rolling Stone guitarist Next slide, please. Keith Richards, when he said, let me be clear, I don't have a drug problem, I have a police problem. <laughs> Poor people in this country, they don't have a drug problem. Next slide, please. This thing that you all call Cracolandia? That's bizarre. That's inappropriate. That's scapegoating. These are your scapegoats. 
Because there are multiple things that go on in these places. And drugs is just a small portion of what happens in those places. Most of the time, drugs are not being used in these places. But you've been told that this is the land of crack. Bizarre. That is absolutely bizarre, but it allows you not to think about these people and to vilify these people and to say they deserve where, they need, where they're at. We did the same thing in 1986 in the US. Next slide, please. So given all of this situation, I can't help but think about my favorite writer's comment when he said that to be, Negro, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be enraged almost all the time. This is what I walk around with in my travels around the world, this rage. So one has to ask, how do you manage the rage? How do you interact with people who are not responsible for your rage? And that's what I have to do because many people are not responsible for my rage. Many people are good people. But when you know all of these things that I know and you know how the game is being played, it's difficult to see your people being subjected to what equates what 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 to genocide. It's very difficult to be a conscious person and allow this to go on without being enraged. And so one of the things that I try to do is to be in these kind of spaces to bring this sort of thing to your attention. To make sure that science, for example, is not allowed, or scientists are not allowed to manipulate you all, or you are not allowed to manipulate the public with science. It's one of the things I do. Next slide, please. Another thing that I'm trying to do is to offer a solution, a way that we can actually help. The way that we can actually help is combine our science with our public policy. And today, I just before concluding, I'd just like to offer two solutions. A legal one and an educational one. Next slide, please. Next, please. Next. So I would like to offer that you all, the world, consider first to decriminalize all drugs. Don't arrest people for drug-related violations. Treat drug-related violations just like you treat traffic violations. You can send a message and say the society doesn't approve of that. When people are driving their cars recklessly, we don't approve of that in our society. And you certainly can kill someone with your car. We don't approve of that. But we're not arresting people for many years for that behavior. I'm proposing to do the same thing with drugs. I'm not proposing to legalize drugs. Not, not doing that. The reason why I'm not proposing to, le to legalize drugs is because the population is too ignorant. I'm not worried about drug effects. I'm worried about the hysteria that's going to be said following legalization and you, the, pub the public, believing the hysteria. So before we can go to legalization, I'm asking that we, next slide please, I'm asking that we teach some basic things first. Teach the basics. Teach people about the importance of things like dose. As I said, I've been studying drugs for more than 20 years. The most important lesson I have learned in that 20 years is this. As you increase the dose of a drug, the amount of the drug, the more likely you are to see negative, deleterious effects. That's so important. It tells novice new users, not to start with large doses. If you don't start with large doses, many of these problems that you see related to drugs will be gone, wiped out. I'm also asking people to understand something about the experience of the drug user. Are they tolerant or are they not? If you are tolerant, you can take larger doses. I don't need to tell tolerant drug users that. They already know that. But the public needs to know that, and novice need to know this. They need to know something about the environment, the environmental setting, 
powerfully influences drug effects. If you take a drug in a place like Sao Paulo, where marijuana apparently is illegal, right? <laughs> so if you take a drug like marijuana near a police station out, outlet, if you take it near police, that's not a good thing because you might get paranoid. As well, you should get paranoid in this country, apparently. So it's not a good thing, but you can take that same drug in a comfortable setting with friends who you trust and have a great experience. The experience that you have on that drug will be changed depending upon the setting. People need to know that. They need to know something about the route of administration. When you take the drugs, smoking it versus taking it in the mouth. Smoking a drug, you take smaller amounts because the drug, none of the drug will be broken down before it hits the brain, whereas if you take a drug orally, much of it will be broken down before it gets to where it needs to go. All of these basic sort of things people need to know. Next slide, please. Another thing that people need to know in terms of basic education, and we can talk about these in the question and answer session. Uh, because I want to wrap up so I can give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. You've been great. You've been patient. I, frankly, I couldn't sit there as long as you have. So thank you. But another thing that you all should know is when we think about why people take drugs or when people take drugs, you should understand this precisely. When people do crack cocaine, it's not because they're crazy, as some people will have you believe. People do crack cocaine because if they get real cocaine and a nice dose, it's euphoric. And it might temporarily relieve them from some of their conditions that are not so pleasant. Or they may take it because they're at a party and they want to have a good time. They're not crazy. People don't take drugs because they're crazy. They take them because they are functional. When you go to your physician, and are prescribed a medication for something, and you take it, you're not taking it because you're crazy, you're taking it because it's functional, right? We can talk about that, this in the question and answer session. Next slide, please. As I conclude, this is a picture of Martin Luther King in a 1963 march on Washington, where he made the famous I Have a Dream speech. In our country, in the United States, there are many people who are older than 60 years old, for example. This speech was made 50, year, 50 plus years ago. People in our country who are older than 60, they all remember what they were doing when he made the speech, or they remember what they were doing to fight for civil rights in the United States. They remember going down to the South and protesting. They remember all of those sorts of things. They had, this was their social justice moment, social justice issue of their time, and they all can tell you how they contributed. Next slide, please. The question before you all here today, as we think about the social justice issue of your time, when you look back on this era, the question before you, in the face of this huge social injustice that you have going on, right now in your country, when you look back, the question before you is, how did you contribute to promoting social justice in this era? Thank you.